Well, if you have been around at Compass for any length of time, you have probably had the bittersweet experience of sending off beloved, treasured friends onto a church plant. My husband and I, we have been attending Compass since 2005, so we've been here for every single church plant. And you would think that it would get easier with time, but it hasn't. And this last weekend, we had the joy and the privilege and the honor of gathering together with some treasured friends to commemorate the close of their season in ministry at Compass AV as they prepare to go to serve at Compass North Texas. Now, as me and some of my friends were planning this get-together, there were several decisions that had to be made But what was surprising to me is that one of the most difficult decisions was what do we write down as we're sending them off? We had to decide, okay, what are we going to put on the banner? Or what are we going to put on the cake? Because how do you say we love you, we're sad you're going, but we're also happy that you're going and you're going to start this new church plant? How do you convey that all in a short, sweet message that's going to fit on a cake or a memory book or a card? And we struggled and we thought, how are we going to say this well? How are we going to send them off with parting words that are fitting for the occasion. Well, thankfully, the Apostle Paul, as he closes out this season of ministry to the Colossians in this letter that he is sending to them, he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, does not have that same struggle. He knows exactly what they need to hear. He knows exactly how to, what words to send them off with because he wants to make sure that these parting words these important final thoughts, spur them on, equip them for ministry, and encourage them to continue to run the race well as they pursue Jesus Christ. So ladies, let us turn to these final words and see this important closing statement that Paul had for the church of Colossae that's not only important for them, but is also so important for each of us. So Colossians 4, starting in verse 15, Paul writes this, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hands. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. As Paul is closing out this letter and he's reviewing some of these important people, these important ministry partners, he closes with some final instructions for the church in Colossae. And these final instructions are to send greetings and to share letters. He says, give my greetings to the church of Laodicea and to Nympha, and then share the letter that you've been given with the Laodiceans and get their letter from, that I sent to them and read it amongst yourselves. We don't know a lot about this letter. Most scholars uh, speculate that it was lost along the way, and we don't know much about Nympha. But we can see, even by the fact that there's this sharing among them, that there was a spirit of sacrifice and service that Paul expected among the Colossians and among the Laodiceans. And similarly, you and I need to, point one, willingly sacrifice for the family of God. As I mentioned, we don't know much about Nympha, but we do know that she had a home and that she opened it up to the entire congregation. Now, ladies, you know that's a sacrifice. Having a bunch of people come over to your home Week after week, you have to think, okay, how am I going to arrange the seating? What food am I going to serve? How am I going to make sure all the kids' toys are picked up? Nympha, like us, probably had a million excuses that she could have used to say, no, no, not my home. Maybe like once a month, maybe every other Sunday. But instead, Nympha, every week, week after week, was sacrificially opening up her home so that the church could have a place to meet. Similarly, we see that this church in Laodicea and the church in Colossae were commanded by Paul to share the letters that he had sent them. 
Now, in our day and age, we might think, oh, that's no big deal. You hit forward on the email and they get it, no big deal. But they had one letter from Paul, one letter from the apostle that tells them how they should be living, what it means to be a Christian, and how they should be doing church life. They didn't have a Bible that they could pull out. These were their instructions. And they either had to give up that letter and send it off to another church, which was a sacrifice, or somebody had to painstakingly copy each and every verse that we've been spending this year studying so that this other church could have the same letter from the Apostle Paul. And whether they sent the letter on or whether they sent a copy on, that was a sacrifice for each of these churches. But it was a sacrifice they were willing to make because they realized that the blessing they received from these instructions from Paul, they needed to be willing to share that blessing with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though those brothers and sisters in Christ were in another city in another location, they cared so much about them that they were willing to give up what had been given to them so that they may be blessed. And it's important that as we think about sacrificing for the family of God, that this is something that we do willingly, right? There is no indication in our passage that Nympha grumpily opened up her home. She wasn't like, ugh, not again. I got to open my house again. Can't somebody else do it this week? There's this spirit that this is just what Nympha did. Nympha graciously and generously and regularly and faithfully opened up her house. And that sacrifice for the family of God needs to be something that because of our love for them, we are willing, we are eager to do. Just like we are eager and willing to do for our own biological family. If I had just said, willingly sacrifice for your family, most of us would have probably been like, well, of course, right? I'm going to get up early and make my kids lunch. I'm going to make sure that my husband is well fed. I'd never tell my kids, don't come home today. The house is too messy. <laughs> the doors are always open for them. And that sacrifice, that spirit of willingness, of of course, because I love you, I'm going to give of what I have. What I have is yours. That spirit needs to be how we approach our sacrifice to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because sisters, our biological family is our family for a time. Our brothers and sisters in Christ is our family for eternity. You are going to be spending forever with your family in God. And we need to make sure that our love for them is so great, that our concern for their souls and their growth in Christ is so significant, that we are eager, that we are willing to go the extra mile, to pay the extra dollar, to spend the extra hour, so that they can be blessed by the blessings that we have received. Now, this instruction from Paul to share greetings and to share letters was not the only instructions that he gives in this final, these final verses. He says in verse 17, he says, And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Now, we don't know a lot about Archippus, just like we don't know about, a lot about Nympha or the church in Laodicea, but we do know slightly more because Archippus is also mentioned in the book of Philemon. And in Philemon 2, Paul calls Archippus a fellow soldier. And based on how he refers to Archippus, there is some indication that Archippus was part of the household of Philemon. Some scholars suggest that maybe he was Philemon's son. But while we don't know the details of Archippus' life, we do know that he was a co-laborer with Paul for the cause of Christ because he calls him a fellow soldier. And we know that he had a God-given assignment because Paul talks about that God-given assignment in our passage. He says, see that you fulfill the ministry you've been given. There is something specific that Archippus was supposed to do, and Paul wants to make sure that he does it. But it's not just Paul wants to make sure that Archippus does it. He wants to make sure the church in Colossae are supporting Archippus in this ministry. And similarly, you and I need to point to be a cheerleader for faithful service. 
be a cheerleader for faithful service. Now, I don't know how you responded when you saw Paul calling out, calling out Archippus in these final verses. You might have been like, ooh, I'm glad it didn't say my name there, right? I mean, think about it. For all of history, Archippus' name is in the book of Colossians, and it seems like Paul is kind of like, hey, make sure you keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. There's a little bit of like accountability, a little bit of like, ooh, public exhortation there. And we might think like, ooh, why would Paul do that? Well, we know if there was something that needed to be addressed privately, that Paul knew how to do that. The whole book of Philemon is about him addressing a private issue with an individual. So Paul must have known that this public exhortation would be effective for Archippus's ministry. He didn't want this to be a private communication. He wanted the church to rally around Archippus, to cheerlead him on as Archippus did the work that God had called him to do. Now, if you think about a cheerleader, there are a few things that we can observe about effective cheerleaders. The first is that effective cheerleaders are bold. There is no such thing as an effective, timid cheerleader. Right? We don't see cheerleaders on the side going, go fight, win tonight. Right? No, they are bold in their exhortation. And Paul was bold to call out Archippus. Similarly, we need to be bold as we cheerlead on our brothers and sisters in Christ in the ministry that God has given them. Sometimes I think we're tempted to think, okay, my best friends, those in my small group, those are the people I should be encouraging. And please, encourage your best friend, encourage those in your small group. But it doesn't, you don't have to limit, we don't have to limit our exhortation only to those that we know personally. We can encourage anyone that we see is faithful week after week to do the ministry that God has given them. And sometimes I think we'd be surprised at who needs that cheerleading most. Because sometimes I think we think, well, the people who are on stage, they obviously know that God has given them a ministry. But you know, there are people who week after week stand up here and MC our Bible study. And I'm just going to tell you, even if they are the most gregarious person, having hundreds of eyeballs looking at you is an intimidating thing. And yet, they faithfully get up here, tell us the information that we need to know, and encourage us to more fully participate in the life of our church. And then we have our wonderful music team. And I don't know about you, but I am not musically inclined, so I think, well, they must know they're talented because they're here on stage, right? I, that you, I would not be stopped on stage singing a song for y'all. <laughs> so they must know. They don't need encouragement. Do you know that there are some in our music team who are on stage reluctantly, but they see a need, they know that God has given them a talent, and they're here faithfully, week after week, playing instruments, using their voices in order to usher us in before the throne room of God. And then we have our teachers. And again, this is awkward because I'm on stage right now, so don't think about me while we're saying this, okay? But we have teachers in our church who every week serve us up a feast from God's word. I'm a teacher for a living, and I'm just going to tell you, there is a weighty responsibility for rightly handling the word of truth and presenting it to a group of people. And yet we have teachers who do this every week. Sometimes we have teachers who do it every week in multiple ministries. They're publicly exclaiming God's word. And we may think, well, they, obviously they know how to do that. That's their job. But you know what? Those public exclamations of God's word also opens them up to public attack. And they need to know that we are right beside them, that we are being their support as they are faithful to serve, as they are faithful to do the assignment that God has given them. But don't limit your boldness and your exhortation just to those who have a public ministry. 
You know who could also use our encouragement? It's all of the kids' club workers, right? They are behind the scenes in a lot of ways. But I'm just going to tell you, being faithful to show up week after week in a group of second graders, that is a sacrificial service right? They need to know that we are there, we are, cheer- we are grateful for them, that we're encouraging them, that we are cheerleading them on, even if we don't know their name. I looked out here last night, and I looked around the room, and I saw women who for years have taught the same Sunday school class. They show up every weekend, and they teach faithfully, And they need to know that their church family appreciates them. And whether they're having a great day or they're having a bad day, that we are right behind them, cheerleading them on as they serve our Lord and Savior. So whether it's someone who has a public ministry or it's someone who has a more behind-the-scenes ministry, our tech group, think how grateful we should be for our tech group, right? I'm so thankful for them, right? They need to know, this cheerlead, I guarantee you, this encouragement, the applause just now is an encouragement to them. You don't have to know them. You just need to tell them, thank you for serving. Keep on keeping on because we see how God is using you for the purpose of his kingdom. Effective cheerleaders are bold. Effective cheerleaders are also clear in their communication. If you think about cheerleaders, sometimes they're so intent on being clear, that they will spell out the directions to the team, right? Be aggressive, B-E-A-G-G-R-E-S-S-I-V-E, right? They want to make sure the team knows what they want them to do. And our encouragement, our cheerleading should be bold, but our cheerleading should also be clear. There should be a degree of specificity to our cheerleading. It's wonderful to say, hey, pastor, great job. You know what's even more of an encouragement to them? Hey, pastor, I really appreciated this illustration. It spoke to my heart, and I was able to immediately apply God's word as a result of your study and preparation. I was reminded recently of how effective, specific encouragement can be because I received a text from a friend about one of my kids. Now, you mom out knows there's no, as soon as you see your kid's name pop up in a text, there's a little bit of like, ooh, what's coming next? But this text said, I just want to tell you what an example your 10-year-old was to me. And this text told me exactly what my kid did. It told me the lesson that this lady had learned from it. And it told me how God had used it to encourage her in her life. And I shared that text with my 10-year-old, and her heart grew three sizes because someone had taken the time to give her specific, clear encouragement about something that she was doing well, and it spurred her on to keep on doing that. And ladies, when we are clear in our encouragement, when we are bold in our cheerleading, when we say with specificity, this is, see, this is how I see God working in your life, the hearts of those around us are going to be strengthened. Now, it's important that cheerleaders are bold. It's important that cheerleaders are clear. But it's also important that cheerleaders are motivating. And you may be thinking, well, Yeah, Natalie, that's what cheerleaders do. But ladies, I think some of us are really good at the bold part. We have no problem talking to any stranger. And some of us are really good at the clear part. We'll tell someone exactly what we thought of their work for God. But people leave their conversations, the conversations that we have with them, feeling deflated. Because we're so bold and we're so clear that what it sounds like is here are all the things you could have done better. That's not what cheerleaders do. Cheerleaders don't say, hey, let me point out the ways that you can improve. Cheerleaders say, we are proud of you, whether they win or lose the game. 
And we need to make sure that our encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ is motivating, that they are cheered by our words. This is literally what encouragement means, that we give people courage, that our words embolden our brothers and sisters in Christ, that gives them the strength and the motivation and the fortitude to keep on keeping on in the work that God has called them to do. That's what Paul wanted the church to do with Archippus. He wanted to make sure that they were that brace, that support that Pastor Mike talked about this weekend, that as he was doing his ministry, as Archippus was faithful in his service, that the church in Colossae was coming around him and was motivating him, was encouraging him, was supporting him to keep on being faithful in his God-given assignment. And ladies, when it comes to us interacting with our brothers and sisters in Christ, let's make sure that we are cheerleaders for them as we see them being faithful in the service to our God and King. Paul is going to close out his letter with one more set of instructions. And he's going to say in verse 18, he writes, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. I, Paul, write this greeting. Paul is making sure that they know this letter comes from him. As we've talked about, it was common practice for Paul to use an amanuensis, someone who was like a secretary who wrote the letter for them. But at the end, he's going to authenticate. He says, everything that I've given you, all these instructions, all these exhortations, all of them come from me. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, called to be an apostle, this is what you should do. And then just after that, he tells them one more thing to do. He says, remember my chains. And we may think, oh, what Paul is saying is like, hey, don't forget about me. But that word remember is a word that Paul frequently uses in regards to prayer. He wants what is brought into their mind to be brought before the Heavenly Father. And we need to, point three, strengthen others through specific prayers. Strengthen others through specific prayers. We see in Ephesians 1.16 this use of the word remembrance as being an indication of prayer. Paul writes, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Ephesians, when God, when God brings you to mind, my first response is to thank him for you. I, I think of you, and then I bring you before the throne room of God. And then he says in Philippians 1.3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Every time I think of you, I'm saying thanks, God, for this church. And in our passage, Paul had a very specific reason for requesting prayer, for asking the church in Colossae to remember him. He was in prison. He was in jail. And so when Paul says, remember my chains, he's not saying, hey, just don't forget I'm in prison. He's saying, bring my situation, the specific situation that I am in, before our Heavenly Father. Make sure that you are petitioning our Lord and King on my behalf. Don't forget about me and don't forget to pray for me. And Paul could have just said, hey, pray for me. He could have just said that, but what he wanted them to do is make a specific request. The specific need that Paul had was that he was in jail, and he wanted that specific situation to be brought before our Heavenly Father. And I have to imagine that as Paul wrote these words, and he thought about the fact that the church in Colossae would be faithful to obey them, that he was encouraged, that he was strengthened because he knew that there would be Christians in another city who would be lifting him up before the throne room of God. And when others know that we are praying for them specifically, it bolsters their spirit. It fortifies their heart. It encourages them in the specific situation that God has placed them in. Prayer is the best thing that we could do for someone. If someone needs to be built up, our first response should be to bring them before our Heavenly Father. 
Now, that doesn't mean that prayer is the only thing we can do to encourage someone, but it should be our first and our continuing response to the need that somebody else has. Now, if we're going to strengthen others through specific prayers, that means that we have to know specifics about their life. We can't pray for someone specifically if we've never stopped and said, how can I pray for you? What specifically do you need? What, is this, what are the details of your request? I was reminded this just Monday night of how important this is. I was wrapping up my teaching and was sending it to the printer, and I got a text from a friend that said, how can I be specifically praying for you? And then I went to my printer and it had stopped working. And I said, well, you can pray my printer works. Because let me tell you, while I've taught without notes before, that was not a situation that I was looking forward to on Tuesday morning. And I trust this friend prayed, and then she said, can I print it for you and bring it to you on church? Bring it to you on church on Tuesday. And I said, that would be great. That would be a wonderful, and I was encouraged because she asked, how can I pray for you specifically? She didn't just say, hey, I'm praying for your teaching. She said, what are your specific needs? And then she petitioned God on my behalf, and she stepped in and offered to help. Ladies, if we want to build each other up, we need to strengthen others through our specific prayers for them. Paul asks the, commands the church in Colossae to pray for him, to remember his chains, and then he closes with what, with what seems like a prayer for them. He says, grace be with you. This is a prayer, a petition, that God's grace would be poured out on the church in Colossae. But although it's his closing prayer, it also points to what the entire book of Colossians has been about, which is the grace that we have received because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a reminder that Jesus is above all else, that he is supreme, that he is all-sufficient, that he is all-powerful, that he is all that we need for life and godliness, that because of him, we can work unto the Lord. Because of him, we can live in such a way that people see Jesus in us, that because of the grace that he has given us, that we can build each other up and people can be more effective for the sake of God's kingdom because of how God uses us to encourage them. My prayer is that this grace would encourage us to continue to partner with others in gospel ministry, that this grace would be what we proclaim to others, that we would be an ambassador of our Savior and an ambassador of the grace that he has so richly poured out on our life until he returns or calls us home. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for the grace that is ours in abundance because of the work of your Son. Father, just like Paul asked for your grace to be poured out on the church of Colossians, I ask, Lord, that your grace would be poured out on the ladies in this room. And not only the ladies in this room, Father, but our entire church. May we treasure that grace. May we be ambassadors of that grace. And may we be reminded of the blessing that that grace is. And may we pour it out through words of encouragement, through building each other up, through cheerleading faithful service, through bringing the specific needs of others in our prayers before you. Father, may your grace strengthen us. May your grace encourage us. May your grace be what sustains us as we work heartily unto you. And Father, I ask that even as these ladies break up into their small groups, that it would be a rich time of encouragement. That we would leave this final session, studying the book of Colossians, encouraged, built up to be more effective for the God-given assignments that each one of us have.
Father, may we not just close out this study and forget all that we've learned, but Father, may you be faithful to bring it to mind day after day, week after week, as we serve your son and remember that he is above everything else. Father, I thank you for the privilege that it is to dig into your word. May we be faithful to obey it, to apply it to our lives as you conform us into the image of your son. It's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.